say, uh, I did say when I was uh, talking about this program to other people that this is kind of like our premier Black History Month program because we can add lots of recorded videos and programs from people of the past. But the two of you are really going to talk about uh, fashion, which for many of us is still so important, but also the contribution of so many talented and great stories of these talented um, uh, designers uh, that a lot of us may not know. We, we may know a couple of names. I think probably only one name is the one that most people will know. So, and I'm not going to say who that is, but I'm into fashion. So I knew a lot of this, but Marion, Marion has done a great job, Betty. I thank you for helping her with this and being here as her partner in this presentation. And so I'm just going to turn it over to you, Marion. We'll be here with our eye on you, but uh, know that you'll be excellent, the two of you. Thank you very much. Unmute, Marion. What's going on, Betty? What's going on, Marion? What's going on is Black History this month. And we are so glad that we could be with everyone. Good morning, morning and, and welcome, welcome to, to our, our show. show. As we celebrate Black History this month, we would like to bring little known Black History facts about African American influence on the history of America. Our focus this year will be on fashions. And as you can see, both myself and Marion are decked out in our full African regalia. Fashion is not just about the dress attire, it's about hair, makeup, and accessories as well. So bearing that in mind, we would like to give you a little bit of history on braids and wraps as well as fashions. As you can see, we both have two different types of head wraps on. And uh, later on during this segment, we'll show you how they're tied and uh, do a little demonstration and the history of uh, head wraps. But for now, we would like to tell you about our sense of fashion that has been a part of our people before and after we were brought to America. Now, African-Americans were heavily impacted by the rich heritage of our ancestors. Uh, African clothing is not just about fashion, it's about colors and symbols, and even the shape has specific meanings for the, uh, the wares, that, the things that we wear, as well as the wraps on our head. It's a symbol of creativity, status, and allegiance to African-American tribal roots. For instance, the traditional woven cloth of royalty in Africa eventually involved in what we now call kente cloth. Slide, please. For so long, our impact on fashion has been overlooked or downplayed. This year, the fashion world lost two very colorful and influential icons, Andre Leon Talley and Virgil Abloh. That is why we have chosen to focus on fashion. Next slide. Let me tell you about Andre Leon Talley. Yes. He was a giant of a man, a big, big guy. He was at least six, five, and he was a bit, had a lot of influence on fashions. Leon, Andrew Leon Talley was born on October 16, 1948, and was an American fashion journalist, stylist, creative director, and editor at large of Vogue magazine. He was the magazine's first fashion news director, 
from 1983 to 1987. And it was, he was the first African-American male creative director from 1988 to 1995. And then it's editor at large from 1998 to 2013. Often regarded as a fashion icon, he was known for supporting and emerging fashion designers and advocating for diversity in the fashion industry. His cap days and his capes and his robes, he was well known for. It was his trademark look. He also authored three books, including one memoir, The Chiffon Trenches, which landed on the New York Times bestseller list. He additionally worked stints with Andy Warhol, as well as Women's Wear Daily and the New York Times. He once served as a stylist for United States President Obama and First Lady Michelle during their time in the White House. Tally was born in Washington, D.C., the son of Alma Ruth Davis and William C. Tally, who was a taxi driver. At least one of his grandfathers was a sharecropper. Tally credited his grandmother for giving him an understanding of luxury, stated following her death that he missed her every single day. His early love of fashion was nurtured by his grandmother and further cultivated upon his discovery of Vogue magazine at a local library at the age of nine or 10. Through a student connection that he made in Providence, Rhode Island, he apprenticed for Diane Verlin and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1974. He published top designers. He pushed all the top designers to feature more black models in their shows. In 2008, Tally advised the Obama family on fashions while also styling Michelle for her bold cover. He introduced her to Taiwanese Canadian designer, Jason Wu, who went on to make her dress for the inaugural ball. Andre Leon Talley career as a fashion journalist spanned six decades, earning him respect and acclaim within the fashion industry. Thus, he has been always regarded as a fashion icon. Thank you for listening to our information on Andre Leon Talley. Unfortunately, he died recently from complications of a heart attack and COVID at a hospital in New York on January the 18th, 2022, at the age of 73. Next slide. Virgil Abloh. Virgil Abloh was born on September 30th, 1980 in Rockford, Illinois to immigrant parents from Ghana. His mother was a seamstress and his father managed a paint company. Virgil learned how to sew from his mother. He was raised in Rockford where he attended Boylan Catholic School, graduating in 1998. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2002 with the Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering. He received his Master of Architecture, that's right, Architecture wow. in Civil Engineering in 2006. Apple first met popular musician Kanye West while working on his designs at a Chicago print shop. He was the artistic director of Louis Vuitton's menswear collection beginning in 2018 and was given increased creativity, creative responsibilities against across the Louis Vuitton menswear brand in early 2021. Abloh was the Chief Executive Officer of Off-White, a fashion house he founded in 2013. A trained architect, Ablo, who also worked in Chicago 
street fashion into the world of international fashion with an internship of, at Fendi in 2009 alongside American rapper Kanye West. The two of them became, began an artistic collaboration that would launch his career into founding Off-White, the first African-American to be an artistic, artistic director at a French luxury fashion house. Ablo was named by Time Magazine as, the, as one of the most influential people in the world in 2018. Ablo's designs, which bridge streetwear and luxury clothing, were described as transformative by the New York Times. And according to the Wall Street Journal, he reached a level of global fame, unusual for a designer, an inspirational figure, <laughs> said the BBC. During his work with Kanye West, Ablo caught the eye of Louis Vuitton CEO, Michael Burke. Later that year, Ablo and West artistic partner, Don C launched a retail store card called RSVP Gallery located in Chicago. A year later, West appointed Ablo the creative director of his creative agency, Donda, named for West's mother. Ablo incorporated the LV logo in his debut menswear for the brand. In, on March 25th, 2018, he was named the artistic director for Louis Vuitton's men wear, ready to wear making him the first person of African descent to lead the brand's menswear, as well as one of the few black designers at the helm of a major French fashion house. Over the years, Ablo gained recognition as a DJ and started playing shows internationally, designing several album covers. In December, 2018, Ablo was honored as a leading innovator by Ebony Magazine and Power 100. Ablo was also nominated for his 2019 Menswear Designer of the Year. Ablo lived in Chicago with his wife, Shannon, and their two children. Ablo passed November 28, 2021, at the young age of 41. Wow, Marion, that's some good information. I really didn't know some of the information about him, although I had heard of his story and his achievements. And of course, neither of these two giants that we've named could have done anything or could have competed in the fashion world without forerunners like Patrick Kelly, who's known for his large buttons on his fabric, on his designs, and Willie Smith, and several other designers. And some of those designers are early designers. Right, Marion? Yes, they are. Two of the early designers were Black women named Zelda Barber Wynn Valdez, thank you, and Anne Lowe. Zelda Barbara Wynn Valdez. She was born June, June 28, 1905. She was an American fashion designer and costumer. Did you know she was the first notable fashion designer who made Playboy Bunny costumes? Wow. Zelda Valdez was born in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, and grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. She was also trained as a classical pianist at the Catholic Conservatory of Music. She was very talented. Yes. In the early 1920s, Valdez started to work in the tailoring shop of her uncle in White Plains, New York. 
At the same time, she began working as a stock girl at a high-end boutique. She eventually worked her way up, selling and making alterations, becoming the shop's first Black sales clerk and tailor. Beginning in 1935, she had her own dressmaking business in White Plains, New York. She eventually oversaw ladies' alterations and developed her own dressmaking clientele. Great. She developed the Zelda Wynn, her design and dressmaking studio on Broadway in what is West and Broadway and West 158th Street in New York. Valdez said that her shop was the first black owned business on Broadway. She sold dresses to movie star Dorothy Dandridge, opera diva Jesse Norman and singer Gladys Knight. Valdez also dressed the entire bridal party for the 1948 wedding of Marie Ellington, also known as Marie and Nat King Cole. Additional celebrity clients include Josephine Baker, Mae West, Ella Fitzgerald, Eartha Kitt, and Marian Anderson. Her designing relationship with Fitzgerald was mostly long distance and she allowed her to design based on her own imagination. Valdez also created a new sexier image for singer Joyce Bryant, who Life Magazine dubbed the Black Marilyn Monroe. In the 1950s, Chez Zelda moved to New York Midtown. Her role glamorizing women caught the attention of Playboy's Hugh Hefner, who commissioned Zelda to design bunny costumes for the Playboy Playmates. She created the original Playboy bunny costume, which was presented at the first Playboy Club in Chicago on February 29, 1960. Beginning in the 60s, Valdez directed the fashion and design workshop of the Harlem Youth Opportunities and Unlimited Associated Community Teams. Valdez taught costume designing skills and facilitated fabric donations to the student workshops. In 1970, she designed costumes for Arthur Mitchell's new company, the Dance Theater of Harlem. By 1992, she would design costumes for 82 productions. She closed her business in 1989, but continued to work with them. She worked with them until her death at two, her death 2001 at the age of 97. Next slide. Next, Ann Cole Lowe. She was born December 14, 1898. She was the first African-American to become a noted fashion designer. Lowe's one-of-a-kind designs were a favorite among high society matrons from the 20s to the 60s. She was best known for designing the ivory silk taffeta wedding gown worn by Jackie Bovier when she married John F. Kennedy in 1953. She was born in Clayton, Alabama. She was the great granddaughter of an enslaved woman and Alabama plantation owner. Lowe's interest in fashion 
sewing and designing came from her mother, Janie, and great-grandmother, Georgia, both who were seamstresses. They ran dressmaking businesses in Montgomery, most first families, and other high society. In 1970, Lowe and her son moved to New York City, where she enrolled in S.T. St. Taylor Design School. At that school was segregated. Lowe was required to attend classes in a room alone. That did not stop her. She managed to rise above her peers and her work was always recognized as outstanding. She was eligible for graduation after attending school for only a, a half a year. After graduating in 1919, Lowe moved to Tampa, Florida, where she opened her first dress salon. She returned to New York City in 1928. During the 50s and the 60s, she worked for commission for stores such as Andre Bendel, Neiman Marcus, and Saks Fifth Avenue, to mention a few. She was not getting credit for her work. However, she did open a second salon called Ann Lowe's Gowns in New York in 1950. Her one of a kind designs made from the finest fabrics and meet, were immediate success and attracted many wealthy high society clients. Her signature designs helped her eventually become recognized for her work. She was called by Saturday Evening Post, society's best kept secret the Dean of American Designers. Throughout her career, Lowe was known for being highly selective in her clientele. Over the course of her career, she created designs for several generations of high society families and Lowe created notable black clients as well. As I mentioned before, Lowe was hired to design the wedding dress for the future First Lady Jacqueline Bouvier and the dresses for the entire bridal attendance when she married John F. Kennedy. During the creation of this infamous dress, would you believe her studio flooded just 10 days before the wedding? However, they pulled it off and recreated the dress. She, she lived in 19, excuse me, she retired in 1972. In the last five years of her life, Lo lived with her daughter, Ruth, in Queens. She died at her daughter's home on February 25th, 1981 after an extended illness. Wow, that is so interesting. And I've always admired the gown that uh, First Lady Kennedy wore. Definitely. Uh, because that was just one of my first idols. So thank you, Marion, for that little known history on both Miss Lowe and Miss Valdez. Now, let me give you just a little history on braids and wraps. Next. Bra Braids and wraps were worn by our people uh, and they play an intricate part in our history. Now braids can either be underhand or overhand. Most of what you see today is overhand. And those overhand braids are now mixed with afros and straight hairstyles and blonde hairstyles and brunettes and black and brown hair. It's just really interesting. And the younger generation is bringing it back. They're bringing it back. We are just so glad for that. And uh, as you can see, one of the wraps that you're looking at, Marion has one very much similar. Mine is a little different, but this that I'm wearing can be worn a different way. You can turn it around. You can wrap it. 
You can twist it and then you fold it in and it still has an effect. It gives you a whole different look. So let me tell you, head wraps were worn by both men and women when African-Americans were first brought to this country. They became a way to conceal unkempt hair while the slaves worked in the cotton field. The practice dates back to pre-colonial history in Africa. Head wraps symbolized status, marriage, and family lineage. That's unbelievable because some people didn't really know that. Every single head wrap means something. The type of fabric that's chosen tell African-Americans from what regions their ancestors came from, Ethiopia, from different parts of Africa. And I've been told from wearing my wraps by several people that work with me, they can tell me whether it was a Nigerian fabric or a Nigerian heritage and where it originated from. Uh, during the slave trade, these were with this was one of the few items that slaves were able to bring to America. They were even want to distinguish field slaves from the uh, slaves that worked inside. Uh, Lauren Hill, Sojourner Truth, Nina Simone, all these people, entertainers, wore head wraps as a symbol of defiance and rebellion too at one time. In Central America, the head wrap was used as a way for females to communicate messages to each other, either messages about what they were doing in the homes as they worked, or about their families, or about things, the upcoming events. Afro Creole women defiantly bejeweled their wraps to make them different, as they were treated different from other African American female slaves that were already here. So, my point being is these wraps are just what we can do now. We can incorporate them into our fashions. Even if we're not wearing our African-American attire, they can be incorporated into anything that we wear. So thank you thank for you. allowing us to give you this information today. Next slide. These are the different hair, hairstyles for braids and afros. Uh, they're coming back. They used to wear the afros, as you can see the woman with the big Afro. Now they're all colorful. The young girl is wearing what we call Afro puffs. And then the other braids, they're wearing them uh, more than um, they did when the Afro was out. Well, that is all that we have to present to you right now on fashion. We had a lot of research that we had to do so do you have any questions we may uh, can entertain at this time? We may can't answer them all, but we'll try. We'll do our best. <laughs> Mary and Miss Victoria, you know I'm gonna have something to say. Tell me why each of you chose the head wrap that you have today. Well, I chose mine because number one, I make these head wraps. Oh, so okay. this particular head wrap, if I nice. take it off, and I'll show you, it's one of the easiest head wraps to do. This head wrap go like this, but it also mm -hmm. goes like this. You can just take it off, and it oh, has nice. an opening. Most head wraps don't. I make mine oh, this wow. way because it's simple, and you can put it on and do so many things with it. You can tie it in so that. many ways. So that's the reason that. I chose mine. And it's also because I like the head wraps that twist and can go to the side and do different things. And I wear them a lot sometimes just to get All away right. from them. <laughs> oh, I love it. You know, Betty, that reminds me back in, uh, I guess it was the 40s, a lot of women were wrapped similar to that over their hair when they did used to pin curls. Yeah. And I wonder if that came from that, you know? Yeah. I wonder I think that this particular style is so simple and it's the easiest style to do. And uh, the more elaborate, let me say this in my research, I found that the more elaborate the head wrap and the more decorative the fabric is, the more it denotes royalty and the lineage. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is dealing okay. with lineage. Now my head wrap and my fabric today is not necessarily African, but it's a mixture of African and Middle East fabrics. And style. And it's lovely. 
And my colleagues. Yeah, I, I thought so. I actually to be the thought colors. this was the color by itself, Betty Tate. <laughs> all right, Mary, we knew that you had to get all dolled up. So tell us about your head wrap. Well, um, I, uh, you know, I got my inspiration from the different head wraps from Betty because she sews a lot. And um, it's just a piece of fabric and it's tied up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I like big things on my head. <laughs> so yes, I had to create know. a head wrap. And all it is is just tied in a bow. Mm -hmm. And I did really? that because I have the colors I have on red and I have on black stones. Mm -hmm. What's well, lovely. It's very flowery. And I remember one other time, Mary, and a few years ago, that you wore a really interesting head wrap into the center. And it seemed like it was more of the... Um, texture of the fabric that you did in your first slide right you know but uh, i love this and you know i think it's important uh to talk about things like fashion really it, it kind of it's something that can connect us all you know i think it's an important communication piece so and you know i like mary, to dress i mary, do well, hello i know that much about you <laughs> mary and how did you how do you if it's just a bow how did you fasten it to your to your hair um, well, if I take it off, I won't be able to put it back on, but it all I did, what, mm -hmm. it's just tied, Tied. see, it's just tied, and then I tied it in a bow and pulled it. Okay, so it's wrapped, it, you bring it up from the back of your head? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. Okay, I didn't see that part. Yes, it's it's mm -hmm. it's tied from the back to the front. Okay. Now, let me let me ask you this. I hope it is not a sensitive question. I ha I love hats and I love wearing, you know, scarves around my head. I like all that stuff. I'm not very good at it. I I really don't have the talent for it. But my question is and I wonder the same thing about wearing those caps that I had when I was getting chemo. Um, about mm. when I when I uh, when I wear those, I like them because they're fashionable. But I don't. I I feel uncomfortable wearing them because I because I think I'm trying. People might think I'm trying to put on that I'm still getting chemo and that I should be you know pitied and and all that stuff. And really, it's just a fashion statement. And the same thing with these head wraps. Would it, is it offensive for a white person to wear these head wraps that were African in origin? No, not at all. And, and, uh, and I don't know if Mary is answering that, but I'm gonna allow her to answer it. But as a seamstress, no. Uh, what you can do, and I'm gonna suggest this, is you can add stuff yourself. Sometimes I suggest to my clients that they add a pin or a brooch or that they take some other fabric colors and wind them around and twist them and put them around those chemo hats. Because I know what you're talking about. My son went through chemotherapy and a lot of the little girls that were at Eggleston when he was there, that's what I would suggest. Put little butterflies on there, something you mm. like on it. And it's not offensive. No, but those no. hats can be basic, but you can add stuff to them and dress them up too. Thank and you, you can add uh, other things to it, like stickers or, like Betty said, pins. Um, you can add flowers. Yeah, flower, big flower. All kinds so of nice it's, stuff. It's not offensive at all. In fact, it's flattering that you would uh, consider that. And a lot of, uh, in the fashion industry now, a lot of the designers and the, the, the uh, models and, and everything, the stylists, they actually incorporate all kinds of things, both African, European, uh, Italian, uh, mm. the uh, Far Eastern design. They incorporate right. it all together and create a whole style that, that encompasses everybody's heritage. So it's okay. Thank you. I love that answer, Betty. Thank you so much. Because I'm such Betty and Mary and I talk about this all the time that we all bring something to the table, kind of thing, you know, and and uh, whatever we can take, like this statement of fashion and beauty, and also culture. It's wonderful to share. You know, that's how we get to know each other and appreciate. I love it. Other, I think. 
thank you both for that. Anybody else got questions? I could have lots of questions, but I'll get her when she comes in later this week. But I'm looking forward to one day meeting you in person, Betty. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to um, listen and view our presentation and uh, have a good day. And if you Thank have any you more so questions, much. you can email Marion. If people yeah, can go and they, oh, you know, I wish I'd asked that, right, Marion? Yeah. They can do that. Right. No problem. Thank you so much. I, I learned a lot. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Because I remember Very uh, Virgil Abloh, they had an exhibit at the High Museum a while back. Right. Oh, I yeah. loved his stuff. This is, you know, before he, of course, passed away. And, uh, and so I, I, re I really loved, I mean, I couldn't buy her his stuff because it was too expensive, but it was so cool. And, uh, but anyway, thank you so much. Thank All you right. for having us. It was very, very good. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Marta. <laughs> Bye. <Mary>. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Make sure we'll bring you all something with a different flair and flavor. Thank you, know Valerie. What? I, let's just do this again. It doesn't have to be for Black History Month. Really? Oh, we just right. need to really. Why? You know what I mean? Let's just do it again, Mary. When we come back in the building, this can be a program we'll do in the great room. We'll have you and Betty in there. How about that? Okay. That would be fabulous. And maybe you can even do it, Betty. Maybe you can even help people understand how to do these ties. You know oh, how sure. to talk.